Hi everyone, can you see me down here in the corner? My name is Tiffany and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm going to read you a story today. This book is called The Bracelet. I'm excited to read it to you for a lot of reasons. One of them is because it tells a story of something that my own family went through. Uh, in 1942, shortly after the outbreak of war with Japan during World War II, the United States government took over 120,000 West Coast Japanese Americans, and two thirds of them actually were American citizens, and they put them into prison camps where they lived for a couple years. Um, in this story, you'll hear the main character is going to be sent to a camp in the Utah desert, and that is the same camp that my mom's mom's side of the family went to, and it's called Topaz. So while this isn't exactly the story that my family had, there are a lot of similarities, and I'm really excited to share it with you today. All right, let's get started. That bracelet. So you can take a look at this illustration here. You can see there's a sign on the house. Looks like they're selling many things. They've crossed out washer, but they're still selling plants, beds, double beds, chairs. Emmy didn't want her big sister to see her cry. She wiped the tears away quickly, but couldn't wipe away the sadness inside. It's almost time to go, her mother called, and Emmy knew they would have to leave their home soon. She looked around her room. It was as empty now as the rest of the house, like a gift box with no gift inside, filled with a lot of nothing. Emmy closed her eyes and tried to remember how it had looked. Flowered chintz curtains at the window, her clothes scattered everywhere, her favorite rag doll and teddy bear sitting on the chest. She could even remember how the whole house looked if she closed her eyes and kept pictures of it inside her head. Emmy and her family weren't moving because they wanted to. The government was sending them to a prison camp because they were Japanese Americans and America was at war with Japan. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were being treated like the enemy just because they looked like the enemy. The FBI had sent Papa to a prison of war camp in Montana just because he worked for a Japanese company. It was crazy, Emmy thought. They loved America, but America didn't love them back and it didn't want to trust them. Emmy ran to the door when she heard the doorbell. Maybe she thought a messenger from the government would be standing there tall and proper and buttoned in a uniform. Maybe he would tell them it was all a mistake and they didn't have to go to camp after all. But when Emmy opened the door, it wasn't a messenger at all. It was her best friend, Lori Madison, who was in the second grade with her. She hadn't come to walk to school with Emmy and she hadn't come to ask her to go roller skating. She hadn't come to show her a new dress or ask her to go to the store with her either. She came with a gift, as though she'd come for a birthday party, but she wasn't wearing her good party dress as she stood, as she looked just as sad as Emmy felt. Here, she said, thrusting her gift at Emmy, it's a bracelet, it's for you to take to camp. Lori helped Emmy put on the bracelet. It was a thin gold chain with a heart dangling on it, and Emmy loved it the minute she saw it. I'll never, ever take it off, Emmy promised, not even when I take a shower. Lori gave Emmy a hug. Well, goodbye then, she said. Come back soon. I will, Emmy answered, but she really didn't know if she'd ever come back to Berkeley. Maybe she would never see Lori again. She watched as Lori walked down the block, turning and waving and walking backwards until she got to the corner. Emmy couldn't bear to watch anymore, and she slammed the door shut. When the doorbell rang again, it was their neighbor, 
Mrs. Simpson. She'd come to take them to the center where all the Japanese Americans were to report. Come on, Emmy, get your things, her sister Reiko called. It's time to go. Emmy made sure her gold bracelet bracelet was secure on her wrist. Then she put on both her sweater and her coat so she wouldn't have to carry them. They could only take what they could carry, and her two suitcases were already full. Each member had an, each family had a number now, and Emmy put tags with their number 13453 on her two suitcases. Mama took a last look around the house, going from room to room. Emmy followed her, trying to remember how each one had looked when they were filled with furniture and rugs and pictures and books. They went out for a last look at the garden Papa loved. If he were here now, Emmy knew he would pick one of the prettiest carnations and bring it inside. This is for you, Mama, he would say, and Mama would smile and put it in her best crystal vase. But now the garden looked shabby and bare. Papa was gone and Mama was too busy to care for it. It looked the way Emmy felt, lonely and abandoned. When they got to the center, Emmy saw hundreds of Japanese Americans everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas and mothers and fathers and children and babies. Everyone was clutching bundles and suitcases tagged with family numbers. Some were crying, but most just sat quietly. Emmy's stomach was jumping up and down, and she wondered if everybody was as scared as she was. She touched the small gold heart on her bracelet and tried to feel brave. When she saw soldiers carrying guns with bayonets standing at every doorway, she was so scared her knees began to wobble. Will they shoot if anyone tries to run away? She asked her sister, but Reiko just shrugged. I don't know, she said solemnly, maybe. Soon it was time for everyone to board the buses lined up at the curb. They would take them to Tanferan race tracks, where the army had what, which the army had turned into a prison camp. As the bus started down the streets, she knew so well. Emmy kept her eyes on the window. They passed the Kato, Kato grocery store, where Mama used to buy bean curd cakes and pickled radishes. The windows were boarded up now, but Emmy saw a sign still hanging on the door. It said, we are loyal Americans. I am too, Emmy thought. We all are, but the army didn't seem to think so. The bus sped down to the water's edge and crossed the Bay Bridge, looking silvery in the sun. Goodbye, bridge, Emmy whispered. Goodbye, San Francisco Bay. Goodbye, seagulls. Emmy glanced at her sister sitting next to her and could tell she was trying hard not to cry. Stupid army, Reiko was muttering. Stupid war. And then they were at the Tanfran racetracks. There was a barbed wire fence all around it and guard towers at each corner. Armed guards swung open the gates to let the buses in and then closed them so no one could get out. They were locked in. They were assigned to Barrack 16, apartment number 40, and Papa's friend, Mr. Noma, helped them look for it. It wasn't among the mass of army barracks built around the racetrack or in the infield. In fact, it wasn't a barrack at all. It was a long stable where the horses had lived and each stall had a number on it. Well, here it is, Mr. Noma said as he came to a stall marked number 40. This is your apartment. Amy and Reiko peered in sight. Gosh, mama, it's filthy. No matter what anyone called it, it was just a dark, dirty horse stall that still smelled of horses. And the linoleum laid over the dirt was littered with wood shavings, nails, dust, and dead bugs. There was nothing in the stall except three folded army cots lying on the floor. 
Mama tried to cheer them up. I'll have Mrs. Simpson send us materials for curtains, she said. It will look better when we fix it up. But Emmy could tell Mama felt just as bad as she did. And no one could think of anything more to say. Mr. Noma went to get mattresses for them. I'd better hurry before they're all gone, he said. He rushed off because he didn't want to see Emmy's mother cry. But she didn't cry. She just went out to borrow a broom and swept out the dust and dirt and bugs. It was just after Emmy and Reiko had set up the army cots that she noticed. My bracelet's gone! Emmy screamed, I've lost my bracelet! Emmy looked in every corner of their stall and along the ramp that led to their stable. Mama and Reiko helped her, but no one could find it. It was getting dark, but Mama got out her flashlight and they walked back along the racetrack, retracing every step they'd taken. The track was muddy and full of puddles. The rain had left the day before. They looked and looked, but they couldn't find Emmy's bracelet anywhere. It was time to have supper at the grandstand. Emmy stood with Mama and Reiko at the end of a long weaving line, each of them clutching a plate and fork. But all she could think of was her bracelet. Already she'd lost the one thing that would help her remember her best friend. Emmy wanted to cry. Have you ever lost something and it meant so much to you that you wanted to cry? The next day, as Emmy unpacked her suitcase, she found her favorite red sweater. She remembered how she and Lori had both worn their red sweaters the first day of school. They'd had matching lunch boxes too. And after they'd gone to fly kites in the vacant lot near home, Emmy could just see their red and yellow kites dancing in the wind. And suddenly Emmy knew she was remembering Lori that very minute, right inside her head. The way she could remember every room in her house in Berkeley. Maybe she thought she didn't really need the bracelet to remember Lori after all. Mr. Noma came to put up some shelves for them. He'd even made them a table and bench from scrap lumber. The first thing Mama put on the shelf was a photo of Papa. But Emmy knew she didn't need a photo of Papa to remember him. It was as though Mama had the same thought. You know, Emmy, she said, you don't need a bracelet to remember Lori any more than we need a photo to remember Papa or our home or all the friends and things we loved and left behind. Those are things we carry in our hearts and take with us no matter where we are sent. Emmy knew Mama was right. They would soon be sent to a camp in the Utah desert, but Lori would still be in her heart, even there. Lori would always be her friend, no matter where she was sent, and Emmy knew she would never forget Lori, ever. In 1942, shortly after the outbreak of war with Japan, the United States government uprooted and imprisoned 120,000 West Coast Japanese Americans, two thirds of them who were American citizens. They had done nothing wrong or broken any laws, but without trial or hearing, they were imprisoned first in abandoned racetracks and fairgrounds, and then sent to bleak internment camps located in remote areas of the country. In 1976, President Gerald Ford stated, not only was that evacuation wrong, but Japanese Americans were and are loyal Americans. In 1982, a commission established by President Jimmy Carter and the United States Congress concluded after an exhaustive inquiry that a grave injustice had been done to Japanese Americans and that the causes of the uprooting were racial prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Six years later, the United States government officially acknowledged the injustice of the internment, apologized and made symbolic restitution to those Americans of Japanese ancestry whose civil rights had been abrogated.
So my mom actually showed me the letter. There was an apology letter that was sent. And I think each family, their family, um, if they weren't alive, their kids or grandkids were sent a little bit of money. So I wanted to share with you a couple photos of my family members that I am proud of. So if you want to hang on, you can see those pictures and I will share them in a moment. I wanted to share this photo with you. Do you see where I am? This is me. This photo is pretty awesome because this is a photo with four generations. So this is me and this is my mom, Lily, and this is my grandma, Eiko, and this is my great grandma, Chioko Otagiri. And she lived until I think it was 109 years old. So you can see I got to be around her and have a relationship with her even as an adult. So my grandma Eiko, when she was in the camp in Topaz, she was a teenager. So she was maybe more like Reiko, the older sister's age. And then my grandma Otakiri, she was um, a young mother of three kids. So this is my grandma's side of the family. Also, my grandpa's side of the family was... Um, incarcerated in a different camp called Gila River. And because um, my grandpa, my grandpa's father was a well-known Japanese man in the community, similar to Emmy's experience, he was sent to a, uh, he was separated from his family and sent to a different prison camp because they found him to be extra suspicious. I have one more picture I'll share with you. So this one is me. I'm guessing I'm two years old because I'm doing this in the picture or maybe I'm saying peace. I don't know. And this is me with my great grandma Otagiri. Her first name was Chioko, but we called her GGO for great grandma Otagiri. And um, here we are in the Bay Area, which is where Emily's family was. Remember, that's where this story took place. And we are... I'm not sure where we are, but I know that we're in California in the Bay Area. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you continue to learn more about this experience so we can make sure that it doesn't happen ever again. And that includes starting right now with closing prison camps that are open and are holding people who are seeking refuge to come be safe here in the United States. That's an important topic, something you can go talk to some adults about. Thanks so much.